bit of a, a fly through. There's a number of slides here, so John, you might be active on the on the clicking. But uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's good to be here and to to uh, be able to put our story across. So let me first of all just introduce, introduce myself and what we do. Um, my name is Gary Nixon. Uh, I work for a company called IES, and you can see my background is in building services engineering. And we are active all around the world, and you can see I've been active in a number of different regions. IES itself has been around for 21 years, so we have quite a significant amount of experience. One of the quotations that our MD will often use is, if you cannot measure it, you cannot improve it. And coming from where we were 21 years ago, with buildings, there was this sense amongst designers that we just couldn't go and quantify what kind of impact your decisions would make. It would all be thrown in the air type stuff. Our software goes in and allows you to calculate what, how your building will perform at the design stage so that as you make those key design decisions, as you change up the different types of, of design scenarios, you can see how it's going to impact on your actual building. The software itself is made up of modules. It's a 3D uh, it's based on a 3D model, so as you can imagine, uh, 21 years ago that was a big thing. And over the last 20 years, uh, a 3D model has been something that has really attracted people in terms of visualization. As you can see on this screen, you can see there's lots of different modules, and it allows the designers, both the architects and engineers, to go in and look across the, these different areas, whether it's particularly energy. We tend to focus in on energy. We've got a very powerful calculation engine there. We also look at lighting. Uh, occupancy comfort, and ultimately we're looking at the carbon emissions from the building and also the energy consumption. In terms of, of where we are, we're all around the world, we're an international company, we're in 140 uh, countries. Uh, we're being used by architects, engineers, facility managers, cost consultants, brand assessors and many more. In terms of where we come from, as I've said, over the last 20 years, we're looking at being the, the space of design. So the design stage, the architects, the engineers, they're using our software to go in and help inform those key decisions that they need to make during the design. It's very important, though, in the building that when it comes to operating a building, that you can also use that technology. And so we've moved on from just being at the design stage to also moving into that building and operation. Part of our message now is around BIM and like BIM for analysis. And BIM is a as, as was said by Julian, it's become a bit of a driving force. And that's been driven primarily, I suppose, by the UK, as we all know, and the mandate that's come in there. And in Ireland, there's been great initiatives through C to BIM and other, other initiatives here. BIM is about the creation, capture, analysis, and sharing of information digitally throughout design, construction, and operation of an asset in an organized and coordinated way. And in some ways, you look at that and you can go, Okay, that should have been happening anyway, but we're digitalizing this and we're seeing great gains in terms of this coordination and bringing everything together in one place. BIM in the United Kingdom is high on the government's agenda um, and is now mandatory to BIM level two. In terms of how IES operated traditionally over, over the last number of years, key design decisions, as I, as I was saying earlier on, uh, are made at the earliest stages of the whole process. And what we were always wrestling with is this issue where architects um, and engineers would maybe engage on certain key design decisions early, early enough in the process. And what would happen is, is it would get too far on down, down the design uh, before the engineers were engaged fully and it was at a point where they could make significant input and go in and quantify the impact that certain key design decisions would make, such as the orientation of the site, how much glazing is on each facade, how much self-shading devices on the building. Lots and lots of little decisions that are made and that are not being impacted. We're not being impacted. So with BIM, BIM kind of supports that. Uh, just take one step back, sorry. Um, and with this little slide, you can see the, the graphic where the blue line is showing the ability to impact the cost. Um, and the, you can see that the traditional firms in black, the drafting-centric workflow, where it sits at this point where it can be moving into the stage where it's really quite costly to go and make changes. 
at the design decisions that have been made. With BIM, that BIM workflow pulls that forward in the whole process so that people are engaging with these decisions early on and getting much more coordinated as a team. You can actually skip through the yeah. So this is the model level of detail. This is a key slide here. BIM is, is pushing this in terms of creating models of the correct level of detail. Traditionally, in the last five, six years as we've engaged with BIM, this is an area that's been a struggle for us, where there's been models that have, have had a, a significant amount of detail in them very early on, and that could be for a, a myriad, of, myriad of reasons. It's to do with technology that's available, people can go in and, and do the designs very quickly now and, and put that into the model and uh, prove the worth in a sense. But actually, it can be something that can go against us when we talk about BIM and we talk about interaction as, as software companies. Because when we look at this, the model level of detail needs to be appropriate for where we're at. So when we're at the concept stage, the model needs to just have the, the amount of data and uh, the, level of, of, yeah, the level of data that's needed for that stage. And then when it comes to our type of software, when we're trying to move models around software, it becomes an awful lot easier for us to engage and to, to pull that model out. For us as a company, and as we look at, at BIM and the UK government strategy, there's different stages. You've got your strategy, your brief, your concept, definition, design, building and commissioning, handover, and the operation and management, and, and maintenance. And for ourselves, traditionally, as I say, we, we sat in here at the this concept stage up to the more detailed design stage. And that was through what we call VE for engineers, virtual environment for engineers. Over the last six, seven years, we moved into this area here where we've been empowering architects as well, with the VE for architects to go in and at that earliest stage, it's going to make quick iterative decisions, get quick iterative feedback from our software, high level stuff. They can go in, check the orientation, check different aspects of it and how will that impact on my building and then pass that model on down the line. Another area that we've moved into in the last two, three years is the operation of the building and being able to calibrate your model. I'll talk about that in a few moments. So these are some of the images from VE for uh, architects and some images from VE for engineers. And really it comes down to the results. That's the key difference between the two, the level of results. Engineers will want to go in and interrogate the results in much more detail than the architect will early on. They'll just want to get quick iterative of students. So as we look at building performance, and we think of building an operation, um, as I said earlier on, we traditionally have sat at the design stage. But we now offer a commissioning service and also an operation, we, we've got more involved in the building and operation. There's a mismatch, a mismatch between the expectations around the performance of new buildings and the reality of utility bills. The difference between expected and realized energy performance has become known as the performance gap. So as we look at uh, this idea of the performance gap, many of you will be aware of in, in buildings that we need to produce a BER now, building energy see here that when we think about this kind of part L model or BER model, when it comes to prediction of how that building will actually perform, there can be a significant difference between what's shown on the BER results and what actually happens. Now there's many reasons for that. Uh, I suppose the biggest reason is around what's actually taken account of in that part L model. So, a uh, small power, for example, is not taken from any dogs. You've got office equipment, for example, here, servers, lifts, none of those are taken account of in that, in that BER model. So you're going to really struggle to compare your, your actual building with your BER model. TM54 is something that's used by industry to kind of bridge that gap, and it does take account of aspects like that. But still, you don't have real building data. TM54 is really to bridge the gap of the design model to what's actually happening in reality. Better energy prediction at design stage is fundamental to understanding and therefore closing this uh, performance gap. So that TM54 really does help in closing that gap so that that design stage is closer to how the building is going to operate. And there's four models that I just want to present to you. There's this compliance model, which I'm talking about, where there's, for part L, you create this simple model that takes account of a lot of the aspects of the building, but not all of them. You've got the design model, which goes in and takes account of a lot more 
and you can actually go in and really um, drill down and change the activity so that it's closer to what actually will happen in reality. But there's still an awful lot of assumptions taken account of in terms of how all the plants and, and people will operate in the building. Then you've got the operational model. The operational model, the idea is that you're starting to link in now to actually real building data. So you're pulling the data out of the building in some form and you're inputting that into your model in some form and trying to calibrate your model so that your model is as close as possible to how the building is in operation. And then the enhanced operation, and this is where we've moved into enhanced operation model where you can actually link your virtual model into your building as it's operating and uh, enhancing that, calibrating that. So in a building you've got lots of different pieces of data and that's captured through lots of different devices and real age, you've got your BMS system, and you've got all your different meters and it's passed up and in many buildings we're actually capturing this data but the problem is, is maybe it's not being logged as it needs to be and it can be one of the hurdles we encounter is actually gathering that data and having it. But we have had a lot of success stories with this where we've gathered that data and from that data we've plugged it into our model and, and calibrated it. How do we do that? Well, we've got a number of solutions now that we're moving into that, that enable us to do that. We've got Ergon and CI Squared. So Ergon allows us to link into the BMS system, well, no, it doesn't actually. Ergon allows us to take CSV files. Anyone can do this. Get your CSV file from your BMS system. So your data is pulled down into the CSV file. Then the CSV file is then uploaded into Ergon, which is a cloud-based system. You can go in and analyze that data you can look at it graphically, immediately start to see some of the impacts. What you can also do, and I can actually pass on here, um, yeah, that's perfect. Uh, what you can also do is you can create what's called freeform uh, profiles. Freeform profiles, so our system operates on this idea of profiles where you control the model based on these. So they can be really quite simple at the earliest stages in terms of our assumptions about how people are going to come in and out of the building and so on. So this idea of freeform profiles allows to pull BMS data and actually plug it into the virtual model. And Ergon allows that to happen. And this is our kind of interface uh, for Ergon. So a quick example, there's a supermarket bakery. This is the standard type of profile that's used. And then this is the impact of plugging in the actual data has on it. And this is a kitchen and this is the equipment in the kitchen. And you can see here, that there's a spike in the morning, but actually as the day goes on, that there's not the same kind of equipment game that was anticipated. As we look at the, the boiler and how that impacts on that, actually what was happening here is that because there's not that significant uh, equipment game that was anticipated, the boiler is actually undersized in this case, and so the compliance profile is considerably lower here, so this is, this is the profile that was assumed, but through the building uh, using the actual building data and plugging that in, we can actually see that our boiler needs to be an awful lot higher. Chiller, same, but to a lesser extent. The chiller actually was um, was slightly oversized because it anticipated having a higher equipment gain. But actually, the equipment gain wasn't there because it wasn't being utilised the way that the assumptions were, were making out. And so what was happening is, is we actually had, uh, this red line is showing what the, uh, what the chiller should have been doing. Okay, so CI Squared, this is a consultancy-based service. The idea is that we take control of the building data, we uncover the hidden inefficiencies, we reduce the operational costs, we collect, investigate, prepare, and invest. They're the four areas. So I'm just going to take you through a case study. So this is John Lewis in York. Uh, we've got Lateral Technologies, one of IES's clients, was tasked with designing John Lewis's lowest energy store in New York. They were to get the store at 30% in terms of re energy reduction over uh, uh, a recent store that had been uh, created. And innovation was required there. The Lateral Technologies used our Apache HVAC software, which is software that allows you to go in and model all of the different plants in the building and the controls associated. So, what, we, what was found was, because they could go in and model those controls and really go in and, and delve into the design, rather than using what traditional kind of steady state calculations, they were able to actually get a much better grasp at the design stage of what that chiller size should be. And they were able to immediately go um, and uh, bring the, the chiller down. So 
what would have been uh, calculated here was a chiller of 550 kilo, kilowatt hours to service actually what was only going to occur for 1% of the year, for nine hours. Uh, so we were going to encounter a situation where the temperatures would be uncomfortable for people for 0.1% of the year. They were going to design the chiller to deal with that. So what they said is, hang on, let's try and find a different way of doing this. So they actually just went in and looked at adaptive comfort and actually reduced the chiller size down to 450 kilowatts. And the impact of allowing the internal temperature to drift up and very slightly upwards for um, certain times of the year, as I say, 0.1%, it really made no difference to the comfort levels and allowed the justification of a 450 kilowatt chiller which required 25% less energy than those used in other stores. So it means that Patterson's team took into account the customers are likely to wear lightweight clothing on warmer days, making it possible to allow internal temperatures to edge towards 26 degrees at the summer peak. And that would have had to be uh, communicated then as the building's operation. Look, this wouldn't occur, and this is the measures you're gonna have to put in place to actually operate this building. People are gonna have to be allowed to, to dress down for those days. And that was fine. While the um, Apache software allowed Lateral to improve the energy forecasting, so at the design stage going in and predicting how, closing the gap in terms of the prediction if you like, of the, the building's energy in terms of how it operated, we were able to take it a step further using IES scan, which is part of CI squared, and uh, they were able to go in and actually take the data from the model link it into the virtual environment software and through scan what you can actually do is you can hook up the different sensors in the building uh, they go through to the BMS system and we can actually take the data and link that into a cloud-based system called scan and we use them as part of our CI squared technology to go in and really create this enhanced operation model so that we can have that model updated um, much more often across the the year so that we can go in and calibrate that and keep that in mind where it should be and optimise all of the plants and so on. Okay, I'm going to skip through some of these because I know time is coming against me, but here we are. To just take one step back, ultimately what happened here with York is that the, the target was 30% reduction and what happened in, in the end is that they actually managed to achieve a 43.8% reduction in terms of the energy emission across the year. And the reason for that was, number one, closing the prediction gap, so going in, getting a much better feel for what the chiller sizes should have been initially uh, at that design stage using our software. And then also, when the building was in operation, then using it to go in and to a calibrated model, optimizing the plant, making sure it's operating as it should have been, and picking up any errors that might have been occurring or, or that type of thing. Virtual environment software, this really is the hub of what we do. And as I've said, we traditionally have sat here in this design stage, we're moving into the building and operation, and we're also moving into the smart communities through smart cities programs, and also the master planning. We have a, you can skip on there, John, yet yeah, research and development. That's, uh, we've got a large research and development department. You can skip on there again. So we've got a number of projects. We've got Indicate, and we've got Glasgow Future Cities, um, and they are, two just example projects come to our stand, we're at stand 17, I'll tell you a lot more about this, and we'll show you how, we've got a training program as well, which takes you through the software, and takes you through a bit more detail that I've talked through today. Thank you for your time today, really appreciate it, and stand 17 if you want to get any more information. Thanks very much.